Hi, Chris. Hello, recording in progress. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, man. How are you? I'm well, Steve. Nice to talk to you today. Nice to talk to you too. Like most of the people that I've spoken to recently have been stuck at home or locked away somewhere, but you are actually on the road, right? I am in a hotel right now, H hence the crummy looking decor. decor. <laughs> I mean, it's all right. It's not bad, I suppose. I shouldn't complain. It's nice to see somebody who's actually out there playing music again. How's it been? Oh, yeah. Fucking. <laughs> yeah. What where to begin yeah after the, the the year and a half that we had because you know a lot of bands uh a lot of bands had their stuff canceled i mean everybody was like oh bummer you know but we were like at the 11th hour we were we had done pre-production in las vegas for a couple of weeks with like the whole you know a lot of moving parts to our production and uh then we flew to fucking grand zero we flew to seattle which was like the beginning of the pandemic in america right and, and so it was just yeah, we got there and there was this lull over the city of like, you know, what's going to happen, you know? So our tour manager, you know, we did like a low key. Uh, we went to this fucking amazing pub called the White Horse, which is right. It's right there in that kind of public market. Um, what do you call it? Touristy part of of, uh, of Seattle. But I have to give a shout out to this pub because it's just there's no name outside. You go in. It's got this old English. Can you pump the the gizmo to get the beer to come out the guy gives you it's all cash only the guy gives you your change in like two dollar bills and dollar dollar coins it's wow. like he has, he has everything just dialed in to be like this place is from a different century but, you know uh, this, uh, there can't be a higher compliment for a pub than an irishman saying that they think it's great <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's true yeah the beer was like the right temperature <laughs> everything was great you know um but yeah so we went there and we had like a low-key night and then our tour manager pushed back the load in for the crew an hour or two the next day because he said there's an announcement the governor or the mayor or whatever was going to say something and so we got like the note it was like a text popped up and it was like yeah the gig is cancelled tonight we're like fuck so we're like okay we'll just hang out in seattle for a bit and everybody got on the tour buses and we drove to portland for what was supposed to be the second night and we woke up the next morning in portland and it was like tour cancelled so we didn't even get you know so we we did like all the work to right. get out on the road you know we didn't even get to do one show like yeah. it was just like ah now you're going home so it was particularly horrible for us so everybody had it bad but i feel like we had it like we were like ah you yeah because some people had a few gigs and then they had to we had nothing we had all the work and none of the play you know i think we'll just appreciate it all the more when we get back out there right yeah, because we've done a few of these festivals where it's just like, I was like, is it going to be like normal or are they going to have these circles where everybody's in their own little, you know, in the grass like that? And we got up on the stage and it was just normal. You know, everybody was just like, oh, yeah, you know, I was like, God, I hope you people are all vaccinated, you know. So, but yeah, it's been, it's been really fun getting back out there. The question that I spend most of my time trying to avoid asking is about the album title. But with you guys, I'm intrigued as to where this album title, La Band Apart, has come from. Yeah, La Band Apart. It's um, an homage to Jean-Luc Godard. So uh, kind of early on in, in the, the writing process, Stephen sent me, gosh, I'm trying to think what it was. It was like a documentary about the, about the film. It wasn't the actual film. I've seen the film. We've all seen the film. But he, I mean, when we were in college, you know, but he, he sent me like a documentary about it. All right, like a behind the scenes thing. And he was like, let's use this as, as a kind of a, a springboard for like, you know, let's jump into that artistic space in terms of like visuals for the, for the new record, you know? So it was his idea, it was gonna, you know, it's, it's actually spelled slightly differently. It should be our band, Apar, it should be two uh, words there, but he just put it in as, as one like that to just kind of make it our own. It's kind of like The Outsiders, right? That's the film, but it's, um, in English, it translate. It kind of looks as you know, like our band apart. And I think Quentin Tarantino is. It's his production company as well. I think it's called. Okay. I think it's called A Band Apart. So we, which is the the Outsiders movie, but he he made it. So he just went straight for it, you know, A Band Apart, and uh, we went for like our band apart. So you know, I think it speaks a lot about like you know uh, isolation throughout COVID and stuff like that, and uh, 
And it also kind of gives a little bit of a like <laughs> elitist, you know, our band apart, you know, <laughs> better than your band, mate, you know, but <laughs> not, not, you know, not going there or anything like that. Yeah. So it was just like a springboard for like that kind of, uh, those kind of visuals and stuff like that. And so some of the music videos reflect that. And then because from the outset, Stephen wanted me to do a documentary because I do stuff like that all the time. So he was like, you could do that for, um, for the, for the new record and just like, capture the recording of the record so straight away i went to black and white and I, get, I wanted to get a film look and all that stuff you know so so it all kind of stemmed out from that sort of creative uh, area so was that like the initiation of the album as a whole like had you started writing at that point or was that just more of the kind of the aesthetic of the album if you will uh yeah the latter because like the i mean St Stephen in terms of like the the music isn't in any way inspired by the film the music like lyrically Stephen you know we were all isolated Stephen and I were doing podcasts and uh so we'd get together because we both lived in San Francisco at that time he still lives there I live in LA now but we would get together and do these acoustic jams and put them out on our social media and stuff like that you know and it was a lot of fun but at the same time it was like it's time to write the new record and then I moved to LA and Stephen just kind of went into his own little isolation in um, in Bolinas, uh, just north of San Francisco, and he just started banging out these tunes. So he then went to Encinitas with Colin, our keyboard player producer, and uh, they just got together and started banging them out. And I remember Colin saying, "You know, normally Stephen shows up with like, hey, I came up with this chord. Check it out. He's like, I learned this new chord, and I've got this idea. And then you have one full song, and then a bunch of like." you know, hit recordings of him with his phone going, du, 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 and then, du, 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 you know, singing out the drums and all that kind of stuff. And then we get together and we flesh it out like that. But for this album, he like showed up and he was like, all right, so I've got this song. And he like played the fucking song and he was like, all right, now I've got this one. And it was like, wow. You know? So he, he had gone into this kind of like campfire, uh, you know, gone back to kind of basics. And that's the way we approached the whole record. We just said like, let's get together. We got together in West Hollywood here. And we just fucking started acoustic rehearsals, just, uh, you know, nothing louder than the vocal. It was like, you know, we weren't, it wasn't like a big production facility where you're trying to talk over the drummer who's fucking hitting the snare drum all the time and stuff like that. You know what I mean? We just were like this close to each other, just going like, let's go to an A minor here, you know, that kind of stuff. So we just kind of fleshed out the songs like that. And then we went into the studio and we just had the mindset of like, let's just get in a room and record it all kind of live, you know, and just do it all together. And that's what the documentary shows. And, you know, because there's a lot of veneer on the other side of recording, you know, people get the album and they go like, oh, yeah, yeah. there's this kind of idea that musicians kind of show up late, maybe white glove the whole thing and then fuck off home. And then the album gets released and they come out and go, yeah, we're amazing. Yeah. But the documentary, I think, shows, you know, how hard bands actually work. You know, we go in there every day with a blank canvas you know we're like we're going to record this song today yeah. and it's five dudes in a room with our engineer and our tech and you know hit and record and like creating that from the from the ground up third eye blind over the years you know you've had a lot of success like looking at the numbers here over 12 million albums sold you're nearly approaching 30 years as a band i know that you've been in the band since 2010 I checked and semi charm life has 18 million views on YouTube now, which is an insane amount of numbers. But in 2021, as a band, how do you view success? How do you define success? I think success is just getting away with it, really, isn't it? It's like <laughs> we're, we're still, none of us have to get a real job. Um, I think that, yeah, the, the there are some bands that are from back in the day, like that, as it were, like, and we're one of them for sure. But there are some of them that kind of just seem to kind of coast on their laurels, you know, they're kind of like, you know, they're constantly in competition with their previous work and they're not really doing anything new. I'm not shitting on any, anybody out there. If you're out there uh, in this fucking industry and you're, you're, you're uh, getting away with it, then you're, you're successful, you know, then my hat is tipped to you, you know, like when I was younger, I used to think, you know, you'd be snobby about boy bands or, you know, because we were all trying to learn difficult shit to be like your chops. You know, if you're going to be a lead guitar player, you want to be, you know, you want everyone to be like, oh, fucking hell, you know, you don't want to play three chords and be like, 
la la la, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, so I used to kind of be like, oh yeah, fuck that. But th- now it's like the point where, like, I remember seeing a documentary. I'm trying, I'm blanking on what band it was. It might have been like Take That, you know, Take That from the UK. Yeah, well, um, I'm from the UK, so. Yeah, you sound like you're a Nordy. Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Chester in Northwest England near Liverpool, but now I'm in Montreal. Oh, okay, right, right. Yeah, um, yeah. I was like, is he like a, a naughty? Like, <laughs> um, but uh, but I think it was take that. They had like some sort of behind the scenes thing, and it was on one night on like Channel Four or something like that. And I just I fucking put it on. I was going like, what the fuck? It was like, I was like they're just like us. It was like they were out. You know, up early doing radio, traveling to the gig, doing their sound check, you know, doing some press before the show, signings, all that kind of shit, doing the gig, getting fucking wasted, meeting a bunch of birds after the show, it was, uh, and then on to the next city, you know, and I was going like, it's just like this kind of thing of, you know, now it's anything behind the scenes like that, I'm just in 100%. I, I watched the fucking Britney Spears behind the scenes. I hate that bitch, man. <laughs> and I was like, I was like watching it like, fuck it up. You know, just glued. It can be bad and it can be bad music, but uh, the behind the scenes and just the mechanics of how it all works, when you see all of that, you're like, these people are working really hard, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm trying to think what the question was that you're asking me. <laughs> how, do you, how do you define success for your bands? Oh yeah, yeah. After all, these well, that's years. the thing. It's just that, like, Stephen is always like he he's not terribly nostalgic at all. So he's never really looking back. They did a documentary a couple of years ago. Now it was for um, motorcycle drive by, mm. and uh, they they kind of went back to New York where he wrote the song and all this kind of stuff like that, you know. And um, I'm not sure that Stephen wants to live in that space where he wants to go. Like you know. This was our heyday or any of that kind of stuff, you know? So, like, since I joined the band, we, we put out um, Dope. I mean, that record took, like, six years to make. It was a totally different band at the beginning. You know, we didn't even have a bass player <laughs> when we started that record. And, uh, and it was just different personnel. And then but from, like, We Are Drugs on, those, those albums just, like, were kind of consistently hungry to explore new spaces, you know? Stephen has no intention of, like going going back although recently i was making a joke i was saying like i think it might be about the right time zeitgeisty it kind of feels like maybe it's time for like a a 90s band you know that's nostalgic now that's what you call it vintage or retro or cool or you know right. it's like if somebody comes out what's that band who they're like just basically led zeppelin we're boss they're amazing but Brett uh, van fleet Brett van fleet yeah we saw them we're, we're mates with smashing pumpkins and the pumpkins were playing them at the forum here in LA, we went out and Greta Van Fleet were, were playing before them. And uh, I was just like, you know, up at the side of the stage, like watching them, like, they're like 11 years old. And the guy is like, Meow! shredding and the dude is like, Meow! and all of that, you know? <laughs> I was like, that's amazing. And that's like 70s Led Zeppelin, you know? So I was like, is it, I feel like it's the, no, it's the right time now for someone to come out and just rip off the Smashing Pumpkins and Nirvana be like a 90s band, you know what I mean? Yeah. And people would be like, everyone would be like, oh, that's so cool. You guys are doing the 90s, you know? Yeah. Well, so, I, I saw a list of um, dad rock bands that are actually quite good, and Pearl Jam was one of them. Oh, um, really? Since when is Pearl Jam dad rock? But I guess, like, I'm wearing a Pearl Jam shirt, so, yeah, and I'm a dad, so I guess that fits. <laughs> oh, right, right. God, yeah. Jeez, I was just listening to... um. God, what's that record? The it's not their first record. It's the second one where just I think Brandon O'Brien engineered it. The guy who did like all the stuff and stuff. Hmm? Versus, versus, yeah, yeah. And uh, it's got the like "Don't Go on Me" and the dum, 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 dum. just like the first like three tracks on it or something. I can remember listening to that on a compact disc in my brother's car, driving around Dublin, going, "Oh, this this is fucking huge!" You know, it sounds so big, but uh. Yeah, God, that's that Brendan O'Brien guy. He's he was responsible for that for that whole sound or load of those bands. He did engineering, yeah. unless I'm mistaken, but I think he engineered that one as well. It's just he's just got that sound. God, yeah. But so God, that, that, that's that's dad rock. I thought dad rock was like Dave Matthews band. Or exactly. Like yeah. <laughs> um. So talking about when you were a kid driving around listening to CDs, like what was what was the band that took music 
from being something that was just on the radio in the background to being something that connected with you um, on a different level? Oh, well, I mean, I, the short answer to that has always been Prince. Prince was like, when I was like eight, I got into Prince. So like utterly obsessively got into Prince. Didn't even know why. I was just like, I want to go to there, you know, it was just <laughs> that experience. And so I would just prance around and act like Prince and uh, save up my pocket money and buy his albums. Back then you couldn't get a lot of those albums in, in Ireland, you know, um, you'd have to go to the UK. So we'd go to visit our cousins over in the UK and I'd be like them to the record shop to see what Prince albums they had, you know. I would buy a Prince record and bring it home and put it on my dad's turntable and uh, headphones on and fucking lionize every inch of the album sleeve and just utterly obsessed so and then you know I, I always tell people that I, I didn't realize you could buy an electric guitar I didn't know you could just go into a shop and go like I'll have that Fender Stratocaster over there you know I thought to be able to afford a, an electric guitar you need to be as rich as somebody like Prince you know I thought they were like, <laughs> yeah yeah and then one of my mates got one for Christmas and I was like the oh, fuck you can just get them <laughs> so uh, I was like I went back to my parents and I was like Ian's got one so they were like well if you learn how to play the old piece of shit acoustic in the attic that's got two strings on it. You know, and I played out, we'll get you an electric guitar for Christmas. And that was like in February. And I got that fucking thing and I got a book out of the school library, chords, and I sat down and bought six guitar strings and broke them and then bought another one. Yeah, and learned the guitar. And then so by Christmas, I was like, my parents were like, fuck, <laughs> it's called our bluff. We're gonna have to buy one of these fucking things. So, um, uh, Prince was like the in, inception for, for all of that. But then like, by the time I was like 15 or whatever like that, I was into like the Chili Peppers and Primus and uh, who did Smashing Pumpkins. Um, yeah. You know, Catherine Wheel out of the UK. I, love, love, I was just yeah. watching some of, some of his YouTube stuff there. Uh, Rob, the, the lead singer. He does like solo gigs and wow. what a singer. He's just incredible. I love that man. So Jeff Buckley, you have a whole bunch of like stuff back then, you know, the, the, the whole catalog of what was going on back then was like, uh, yeah, it was my jam. Growing up. Yeah. And out of all the albums you've listened to in your life, is there one that you think off the top of your head real quick that you've listened to more than any other? God, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm going to look back on this a lot, but it's probably going to be a toss up between Gish and Blood Sugar Sex Magic. Right. Think, which I don't know yeah I'm dating myself but Gish I just remember being in college and it was it was this band that we didn't really know a lot about they weren't really very visible in Ireland but there it wasn't until um the Siamese Dream record came out that they actually yeah uh took over the planet but Gish there's just I just that's just a record you put on and just just leave that shit on repeat if I'm like working around the house you know um, yeah, I, I saw them I on that tour actually. I actually saw them on the Gish tour. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. fuck you. In a little, yeah, club, a you, little club. In a little club <laughs> in Birmingham. Oh, I'm so jealous. Oh, that's great. I saw them on, on the Siamese the Siamese Dream tour in the SFX in Dublin. And uh yeah, that was a night and now you can call them your friends. Well. What's that? And now you can call them your friends. That's kind of a pretty amazing journey, right? Yeah, well, yeah, we've hung out with with, uh, with those boys quite a bit. But uh, Billy was like Stephen Cullen, like the conciliary, conciliar on uh, on the last record because he helped write some stuff. It was really quite funny. Stephen came to rehearsal and he was like, "Billy had this idea," and Stephen played a fucking like an audio thing that Billy Corgan had recorded on his phone, wow. and he was like, "So it's Billy Corgan's voice going." And then maybe you could try like if, if you're gonna go to the sea and he strums his guitar and he goes bah, yeah, nah, nah. and it's fucking Billy Corgan singing our song and talking and strumming it like that and Stephen's just playing it off his phone into like the microphone in, in the pre-production facility we're in and it's coming through the PA and I was just going like God, if I told me, if you told me back when I was in college listening to Gish on my headphones you know yeah, that this was going to happen and then from uh, Jeff Schroeder who is kind of like we kind of laugh and say that he's like the he's like the me in Smashing Pumpkins because he joined the Pumpkins I think like a year before I joined Third Eye, yeah. But he's a he's a really good mate of Danny, Danny Nolan, who's like our our right hand man kind of thing on Stevens, 
kind of assistant. He's, he's Stephen's tech. He did the artwork for the album, the new album. Okay. He's a great photographer. He's, he's like, a, but he was like really, really good mates with Jeff for years. And uh, then Jeff got the the Pumpkins gig. So anytime we'd be around Chicago on tour, we'd go and have dinner with Jeff and his bird and stuff. So Jeff's moved out here now. So just around the corner from the studio we were recording in. So we were like, let's have Jeff come in and play. So he came in and played on uh, a track called Funeral Singers on the new album. So. What has music meant to you in the last year and a half while we've been kind of going through this whole situation? How, have you, how has music played a part in your life? I mean, this I would say the same as it always has. It hasn't, I mean, which is not to diminish it anyway, it's as large a part of my life as it's as it was two years ago or three years ago. The pandemic for me didn't change didn't change a huge amount about my my home life, you know, because I'm kind of a nerdy little dude, you know. Um, so you know, obviously my mileage, <laughs> my my air miles disappeared yeah. but because like the last 10 12 years we've just been doing enormous amounts of travel um i didn't i, I spent a lot of time in japan i didn't get to be in japan for quite a while because it was just completely closed down so the isolationists <laughs> they did it again mm-hmm. um but uh but in terms of music i mean i was still writing i was still listening to music i was you know there was not, nothing had changed insofar as uh the pandemic didn't stop didn't stop us you know we were like you know Stephen and I were still getting together and, and jamming out acoustically and stuff like that and we'd just do these kind of live Instagram sessions where there were just a lot of fun you know because mm. we had to we had to be socially distanced in the videos you know uh even though everybody's masked up and all this like that so we had to like we had to show in the, like I produced all the videos that we, we had to show that we were like far enough apart from each other and then you know people were still giving a shit you shouldn't be in the same room you know follow that so then i was like we should do one of those live you know like a simulcast you know you're in new york i'm in fucking san francisco you're in seattle let's do one of those things because a lot of the bands were had the same idea where they do like a it's almost like a zoom thing where they'd split the screen in three or four or whatever like that and you'd have the four of them but they all cheated they had like one person would play the acoustic guitar the drums or whatever and then the next person would add their bit and then they'd add theirs and they'd add theirs and they put it out and it was everybody in their bedroom kind of it was fine but it was there was no production to it at all you know <laughs> so i was like let's do one that, and it's just fucking really good I'm, i can tell you haven't seen it steve because if you have I'm, I'm sorry you'd be telling me how what an amazing job i did on it it's called <laughs> it's called so alone so alive and it's yeah. uh it's four songs and we recorded them I produce it. It's in, it's in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, New York, and LA. Oh, sorry, I said LA twice, but there were two people in LA at the time. <laughs> I so. promise that I will track it down because I, I, I admit that I haven't seen it, but I will go and check it I mean, out. You, you, I mean, you let me know honestly. You have a look at it and see if you don't think it was like, okay, like, fucking hell, that's good. Because yeah. a bunch of people did want did them and they just found them in. No offense to them, you know. Yeah, for sure. I did it all live and one take and everything, you know. So excellent. Uh, I think that energy is is in the, the video. That's what I'm laboring to to tell you. <laughs> so check it out and let me know. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check it out, especially after the way you've described it. So, um, yeah, I did. I did my segment in like my favorite pub in San Francisco, and I came out with an Irish flag, a bit of Conor McGregor action at the top of it as well. <laughs> it's quite fun. And are you are you somebody that keeps up with new music? Like, are you out there like investigating what's what's coming out all the time? Uh, I think I kind of let it come to me, you know, uh, I, I kind of live in like a little kind of a, a bubble of my own in that respect. Um, I don't think that I'm, I'm not the guy who goes to the fucking, the uh, Spotify new music playlist or any of that stuff, you know, but I listen to Japanese radio and French radio at home. And so uh, stuff kind of filters through that and also some Irish radio as well, I have to say. And my wife listens to the BBC she used to live in the uk for a few years um so some stuff kind of filters through like that and there's a band out of dublin now called soda blonde i don't know if you've heard them but the lead singer sounds like i, w- I was like talking about it the other day it was like she's like equal parts annie lennox kate bush and fucking mr pesto from moonlighting i don't know if you ever saw that tv show with bruce willis and yeah Shepard yeah Shepard. yeah, yeah. so that. there was there was there was a kind of goofy secretary 
and her name was Miss DePesto. And uh, I don't know, it's like anytime I say this to anybody, they'll, they'll go, oh yeah, Moonlight, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, Simple Shepherd, yeah, yeah, Bruce Willis, yeah, yeah. Mr. Who? Yeah, I'm, like, I'm, kind Pesto, of, I'm kind of the same. I can't remember that. Wait, do you remember there was, there was that goofy guy who was like Bruce Willis's right-hand man, or he's like one of the, one of the guys, but he was like a tertiary character, and he was kind of goofy, and he fucked kind of with a lisp. That was guy. that guy. So it was like his girlfriend. He had a crush on the goofy kind of overbite bird at the, uh, she was the receptionist, and she's like big doe-eyed, <laughs> kind of like, you know, there for comic relief, but like terribly sweet and all the rest of it. Anyway, when I watched that show, everyone had a crush on Sybil Shepherd. I, I never, I'm, all, I'm always like, I'm always like looking at the backing dancer going, oh, fucking hell. <laughs> Ariana Grande is here and there's like a wee backing dancer. I'm going, and that's the one there, man. <laughs> so same thing. I was like, Mr. Pesto, she was just goofy enough to be like, I was like, mm, you know. But uh, anyway, this bird, um, God, I'm blanking on her name. But they're out of Dublin, Soda Blonde. Check them out. They just put out a new album and uh, it's on repeat in my house right now. It's cool. Just, well, that's, that's a brand new name for me. So I'll definitely go and check it out. Um, yeah. So thanks for that. And I hear a rumor that you you used to play guitar for a little while with Damien Rice. Yeah, Damien and I grew up in school together. Oh wow! So um, yeah, we were we were in Lucan in Dublin, and uh, then we moved to Selbridge. Our families collectively moved to Selbridge, and uh, we just I guess around the age of I mean we went to school like primary school together, you know, um, which is what I think elementary school or whatever you call that over here. Yeah, and um, and I yeah we we were we knew each other and then around the age of 14 or 15 just when i'd gotten that guitar uh a mutual friend was like hey why don't you come over to the house and we'll uh we'll we'll play together you know and uh, it's so cute a bunch of young boys getting their little amps and getting in the car and going over and uh, so yeah we got together and we just kind of made this like i remember we played like johnny be good and i could play the the riff at the beginning so it was like okay you're the lead guitar player and then Damien wanted to be the singer and you know play the uh the the chords you know just be like the rhythm guitar player or whatever and uh yeah we had a we had a, a makeshift yeah we had a band we, had, we, and we went like you know we played gigs we supported bands and the bag it in in Dublin and all of that stuff we went out and about you know um and we, we were called uh wanted not needed <laughs> <laughs> that was the name of that band and uh yeah we did all that and then damien went on to form god what the juniper juniper is that right juniper. yeah juniper yeah, juniper. Oh, yeah. yeah he, he, he did juniper so so all, all of the guys who didn't make it into our band when we made the band with you know me and damien all the guys who didn't make it in like dominic and paul and brian they they all when damien left our band they all because like Damien always wanted to do more kind of singery songwriter kind of stuff and we wanted to play difficult time signatures and weird shit we were into Primus and stuff we wanted stuff to be hard we wanted people to be like those guys are terribly clever you know <laughs> so uh so we became like a three-piece and just like kind of instrumental until we got a, a, another singer and Damien just went and they made Juniper with those other lads and then when Damien quit Juniper those lads became Bell X1 yeah so uh yeah so it's kind of funny from that one little town all those bands came out you know and so it's funny now because when 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 bell x1 come over here to play i go to see them they played in san francisco a couple years ago and they play like these kind of small little venues and when we tour in europe we play like apart from the uk when we play the uk we play big venues but when we play like dublin was like you know it's a maybe a three thousand cap something like that you know um, full and all the rest of it, but it's not nothing on the scale of what we do over here. Mm. So when I go over there, my parents come to see the band. I'm still at the same level as I always was. She was like, oh, yeah, cool. My mom was like, whatever. And then, but Bell X1 are playing like the big fucking stadiums or whatever in Europe. But then when they come over here, they're like, they do the small venues and we do the big venues over here. You know? Yeah, it's interesting, um, isn't it? It's, it's the same funny, with, yeah. Same with Biffy Clyro. When they play over here, they play to like 600 people. Yeah. Then back in the UK, they're obviously headlining festivals and arenas, and it's kind of a bit crazy. Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah, I, I know Biffy's uh, oh, Graham. I don't know even what his job title is. He's, he's not the tour manager, but he's like one one of the chaps. Uh, yeah. But he like wor he works out of the UK. Um, he tour managed for us in the UK actually, but he works out of an office. He doesn't go on the road with them. But uh, yeah, he was. 
anytime they play over here, he always sorts out tickets for me to go see go see the Biff. Mm. But, um, but yeah, it's nuts. It's such a treat. It's like seeing you know you can't do it with Muse now. I remember seeing Muse in the UK years ago in like a little. They were just a yeah, three piece with, with none of the theatrics. They were just three. It was monster, monster show. Matt had blue hair or something crazy, you know. <laughs> but uh, and now they're just they're like untouchable. They're so the production is just fucking insane, you know. But um, but yeah, it's such a treat to see a band as big as Biffy play like sure. a little venue over here. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, congratulations on the album. Uh, it's nice to see you guys are still kind of moving forward and uh, and doing new things and trying out different different stuff and especially with yeah. the documentary and all that kind of stuff it keeps it really interesting for the fans and yeah, um yeah. thanks for spending some time with me and enjoy your fancy hotel room <laughs> we'll see. all right and uh yeah. yeah thanks again take care